Coming up in today's newscast, Hamas issues a warning not to escalate with Gaza. Israeli fighter jets attack targets around Damascus, Syria. And the southern coastal city of Eilat snags a top spot in the New York Times' Places to Visit in 2019 list. Israeli security forces in the south are on high alert following a weekend of Gazan violence directed at border communities. First, on Friday, around 13,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip arrived at the border to burn tires and throw explosives, firebombs, grenades and stones at security forces. Additionally, according to an IDF spokesperson, rioters crossed into Israel at least three times before returning back to the Strip. When Israeli troops returned fire in response to a grenade and stones, 43-year-old Amal Al-Taramsi, who regularly attended the border riots, was shot dead. As the weekend progressed, a rocket was then launched towards the Stot Negev Regional Council in southern Israel on Saturday night. Thankfully, no damages or injuries were reported, but as per policy, Israeli Air Force fighter jets responded by attacking two Hamas military targets in Gaza. An IDF statement read that they hit two of Hamas's underground structures in the Gaza Strip and that they will continue operating to defend Israeli civilians. Hamas now, on the other hand, is warning Israel against an escalation, accusing Israel of continuously killing, quote, nonviolent protesters in cold blood, and quote, adding that the escalation is dangerous and using fire won't bring security to Israel and its residents. Still, while Israeli officials have already indicated that they have no taste for a renewed war in Gaza, they have also made clear that Israel holds Hamas responsible for any incursion or attack from Gaza, and that no attack will go unanswered. Speaking of weekend attacks, on Friday, after attempting to stab an Israeli soldier on duty near Hebron, a Palestinian suspect was shot and arrested. The attempted stabbing took place at the army outpost near the Kiryat Arba settlement, and IDF soldiers on hand opened fire, neutralizing the attacker. He was then taken to the hospital with his injuries. Thankfully, no other injuries were reported, though, and in fact, it turns out that an armed Israeli civilian also fired at the suspect during the attack. Then in response to the incident, the IDF has reportedly dispatched more soldiers to the area. Violence in the West Bank didn't end there, though, as hundreds of, of protesters gathered in Ramallah overnight on Saturday, burning tires and throwing rocks at Israeli security forces. Two soldiers were lightly wounded and hospitalized, but were released hours later. Both Ramallah and Hebron are often flashpoint areas for violence between Israeli soldiers and Palestinians, but all in all, security services still maintain that the overall number of attacks is down. As a testament to the fact, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan paid a visit to the headquarters of the Israel Police Special Anti-Terror Unit, and while there, they commented on the unit's reception, uh, recent cooperation with the Shin Bet and successes like catching the terrorists who attacked Ofra, Barkan, and Givat Asaf in recent months. Netanyahu said that the citizens of Israel need to know that whoever attacked or murdered an Israeli citizen in the past year was either eliminated or apprehended, and that this is an unparalleled achievement in the world, thanks to the daring, heroism, creativity, and commitment of these units. Now moving on to Syria, Syrian state news agency Sana reported Friday night that at around 11.15 before midnight, Israeli warplanes launched many missiles towards Damascus. But Syrian air defenses intercepted them and downed most of them. Additionally, over eight spots in Damascus were reportedly targeted, including a munitions warehouse at the Damascus airport that was struck, though Syrian government officials have indicated that airport activity has returned to normal. Video footage of the incident reveals explosions in the sky as alleged Israeli missiles rained down upon Damascus, and the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights clarified that the attack was likely targeting Hezbollah missile depots. That being said, other reports claim that Syrian military targets like the military airport Al-Maza and the Daria military hospital were more specifically in the crosshairs. The Daria military hospital, by the way, is used as a weapons depot as well and not as a hospital. And finally, though the targets were all around the Syrian state capital of Damascus, reports all seem to indicate that the attack was launched from over Lebanese airspace, and with Israeli naval forces off the Lebanese coast just in case. Given the Israeli government's vow to continue preventing Iran from entrenching in Syria at any cost, however, this attack isn't as surprising as it may seem. In fact, Israeli officials over the weekend again admitted to conducting hundreds if not thousands of strikes against Iran and Iranian-backed groups to the north. <laughs> לבלום את ההתבססות הצבאית של איראן בסוריה, ובמסגרת זאת צהל תקף מאות פעמים 
מטרות של איראן וחיזבאללה. This also comes despite Russian forces demanding more cooperation from Israel in Syria with respect to military operations, especially after last month's attack which Russia called provocative and the September downing of a Russian spy plane. Now returning to the studio with more on the weekend events in Syria is the founder and executive director of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, Dr. Martin Sherman. Dr. Sherman, as always, it's a pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having me back again. All right, so first of all, can we assume that Russia knew about this latest attack, given that their response and their condemnation of it has been relatively, you know, minimal? Well, there is rumored coordination with the Russians. I wouldn't be surprised to find that... Uh, the Russians were given advanced warning, perhaps not, not too advanced warning, mm. but a certain amount of a warning so that they can keep their assets out of, uh, out of harm's way. I see. And then, uh, I don't know, do, do you think that Israel can then continue to operate in this way? Or do you think that maybe Russian forces, uh, you know, especially with their S-300s, are going to become more uh, well, effective? I, I must say, I, I feel a little uncomfortable about Israel talking about it so openly. You know, I, I don't think that, that, that bragging about uh, uh, thousands of attacks on targets in Syria and uh, Lebanon, uh, I, I don't like that. I, I think ominous silence would probably be just, uh, just a greater deterrence. I mean, no one really thinks it was the Spanish Air Force that was bombing them. Well, so, why, why, do you think, why do you think then that that change was made? Because you're right, you know, Israeli officials have become a little bit more vocal yeah. uh, as uh, of late. Well, I would advise them not, not, not to. Uh, some people would probably suspect, the more cynical among us would probably suspect it as something to do with the elections. Um, you know, I would hope it's not that. Uh, but as, as I say, uh, I, 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 I think it's a mistake to be too forthright about it because it certainly doesn't reduce the potential for retaliation on the other side. Uh, you, you know, the more, the more Israel shows what it's doing and talks about what it's doing, eventually will bring up some kind of desire, some kind of urge to, to retaliate, whether it be successful or not. I mean, we've already seen the Iranians retaliate outside the borders of Israel, like blowing up Israeli assets in, in Argentina, for instance. So I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think talking about this is the most prudent policy. All right. So, you know, speaking of, of policy, though, within, you know, how Israel has been attacking in Syria, Iranian assets mostly, um, if, if Israel is attacking mostly Syrian and Iranian assets, uh, like Gadi Azenkadi talked about his campaign between the wars. Are we winning? Is that something that we can say? You know, we have thousands, thousands of airstrikes and well, well, I, I think, I think, I think we've been year. operationally successful. I don't know whether that's a military victory, but we've been operation, yeah, how, how operationally we... successful. I think we may have delayed Iranian buildup in Syria. But, but I, I think the real strategic issue about halting the Israeli, Iranian expansion and military adventurism is what happens inside, inside uh, Iran. And, and, and I, I think uh, the effectiveness of the American sanctions there are far more important than 2,000 American troops in, 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 in northern Syria. Because I think as long as we can debilitate the Iranian regime there, reduce its assets, make it have, have less and less resources for, for its adventurism abroad. That is the real card that needs to be played. But do you think, that, can Israel continue to do that? Do you think, do you well, think that we've shown any, any sign that you know, our ability to hamper Iran might be slowing down? Perhaps that's why they're being so vocal about their attacks no, recently. I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how many covert attacks have been. We don't, we don't know about everything that's been, that's been uh, uh, executed. I, I think Israel has done a good job operationally. I don't think that you can stop Iran solely from the air. I think eventually, if you really want to stop it, they're going to have to commit ground troops to it eventually at some stage. I think you can delay it. You can probably contain it for a while. But I think the, the, the major point is, is weakening the Iranian regime from domestically, as I said before, because you know, there's a lot of ethnic tension there. Sure. There's a huge water crisis. Uh, the economy is not doing well. The, the Iranian uh, currency is, is, is plunging. So I, I, I think that if you can contain them up to a point until there's, there's uh, irresistible pressure for sure. regime change in Iran, I, th I think that's, that's the combination that we, that we need to be looking at. All right. Dr. Sherman, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot is set to leave his post this week after some 40 years in service in the IDF. But Eisenkot, unlike his predecessors, has mostly shied away from the media uh, throughout his tenure. So his upcoming departure has offered a rare glimpse into the man responsible for Israel's security these past four years, 
and it turns out unsurprisingly that he's been very preoccupied with Iran. In a series of interviews with Israeli news channels and in an interview to the New York Times, Eisenkot revealed just how serious a threat Iran poses to Israel, investing some $16 billion over seven years to build up an army of Hezbollah, Shiite, and Iranian forces in Syria. As such, Eisenkot revealed that in 2017, Israel, under his guidance, decided to change its strategy and shift to near-daily air force attacks to counter this threat. Eisenkot revealed that Israel has over the years struck thousands of targets without claiming responsibility or asking for credit with regards to the military campaign against Iran and its proxies in Syria and Lebanon. Also in the interviews, Eisenkot opened up about his strategic view, i.e. fighting the campaign between wars, which is continually attacking and weakening the enemy by downgrading its capabilities. Eisenkot explains that this strategy both lengthens the time between wars and improves the chance of winning them when they erupt. That's why, despite the Iranian threat, Eisenkot seems to have outmaneuvered his Iranian rival, led by Qasem Soleimani, the commander of Iran's elite Quds force and the man behind Iran's military policies. Eisenkot said that Soleimani made a mistake by choosing a playground where he's relatively weak and where Israel has, quote, complete military superiority. He added in the interviews that Iran is a long way from achieving its goal to destroy Israel and that instead Iran was even scaling back, adding that he who acts against us puts himself in danger. Meanwhile, also on the northern border, the IDF announced on Sunday that Operation Northern Shield is nearly complete. An army statement released this morning read that the discovery of this sixth and last attack tunnel from Lebanon meant the effort to locate the passages dug by Hezbollah that crossed the border into Israeli territory has been completed, and the neutralization of this passage will be completed in the coming days. That being said, northern command officials have reiterated that there are other tunnels and underground infrastructure sites that Hezbollah has built though they have yet to cross the border into Israeli territory. Additionally, since the Israeli operation Northern Shield was begun, the Iranian-backed Lebanese terror group has halted their tunneling altogether. Transportation and Intelligence Minister Israel Katz, among many others, already congratulated the IDF on completing their mission, and said that Hezbollah leader Nasrallah's silence attests more than anything to the success of the operation. But despite the IDF celebrations, the tunnels were no small thing. Brigadier General Ronen Manelis even said that this latest tunnel was 55 meters or nearly 180 feet deep and even contained railroads to, quote, transport equipment, garbage, lighting equipment, and ladders into Israeli territory. A lot of resources were invested in this tunnel, end quote. Moreover, the tunnels may now have been stopped or slowed, but the threat from the north has not been eliminated. Therefore, the army has also announced that IDF troops and the tunnel finding lab will continue serving permanently along the Lebanese border. And finally, the construction of another border wall, this time along the border with Lebanon, is still underway, and upon completion will cross the entire northern border at a cost of roughly 1.7 billion shekels, or around half a billion dollars. Lebanon has objected to the wall in the international arena, including again at the United Nations over the weekend, saying that the wall amounts to a new violation of Lebanese sovereignty by Israel. Israeli ambassador to the UN, Dani Danone, responded, however, that perhaps instead of making false complaints, the Lebanese government should roll up its sleeves and address Hezbollah's violations. A poll conducted this weekend at a retreat event for Likud members in Eilat has just revealed that nearly 70% of Likud supporters would back Prime Minister Netanyahu's decision to stay in office, even if indicted for corruption. Additionally, poll results show that 44% of the respondents think the Likud should remain alone in the elections rather than merging parties. And lastly, the poll asked Likud members to rank their favorite Knesset members and ministers. As expected, most of the current Likud list ranked well. It was a bit surprising, though, when certain ministers like Chaim Katz and Ayub Ka were left out completely. Meanwhile, on the other side of the political aisle, Labor leader Avi Gabay is calling on anyone who will listen not to join up with the Likud, both before elections and after, should the Likud win. In fact, speaking to a crowd in Netanya over the weekend, Gabay said that it was important for all the candidates in the oppositional camp to commit themselves in advance to only sit in a coalition that is committed to change, i.e. not with the Likud and the right. Though after splitting up the Zionist Union, labor itself is in shambles, and multiple Labor Party activists and possibly even two to three Knesset members are reportedly eyeing the exit sign, looking for a changeover to either Tzipi Livni's Hatnua or Benny Gantz's Israel Resilience Party. As for former Defense Minister Moshe Alon, who recently started the new Telem Party, he too wants to unseat Netanyahu and the Likud, and he too wants to create a unified bloc in order to do it. But it's unlikely at this time that the Labor Party will be a part of Telem's bloc. Finally, Yeshatid leader Yair Lapid also maintained that while he never doubted the Prime Minister's patriotism, he will not join a Likud coalition if Netanyahu is indicted. Moshe Kahlon, the head of the Kulanu party and a member of the, member of the current coalition, made similar comments. Violence erupted between Arab Christian protesters and police on Friday in Haifa over the continued display of the McJesus sculpture at the Haifa Museum of Art. 
Created by Finnish artist Janne Linunen, the piece shows a crucified Ronald McDonald and was put up in August as part of the Sacred Goods exhibit. While hundreds of demonstrators came out on Friday against the sculpture as being extremely insensitive, with most of the protesters trying to break into the museum by force. Meanwhile, other demonstrators and rioters threw stones and clashed with police, and three officers were lightly injured. One person even threw a Molotov cocktail at the museum the night before, and the Haifa Catholic Church has also denounced the exhibition and, of course, the sculpture in question. So how did the museum respond? Well, so far, museum director Nisim Tal agreed to put up a sign alerting would-be visitors of the offensive content inside. But ultimately, demonstrators are not appeased. One protester explained to Walla News that the refusal to remove the sculpture reveals a great double standard within the Israeli culture, saying, quote, if they put up a sculpture of Hitler with a Torah scroll, they would immediately respond, end quote. In other news, nine activists from the BDS movement in Spain are scheduled to testify in a Valencia court on Monday, accused, among other things, of inciting hatred. The case dates back to 2015 when the BDS group in Spain led a campaign against the famous Jewish-American singer Matis Yahu. And Al TV's Joy Gabijon is here with more details. Thanks, Aaron. So as you said, everything starts back in 2015. Matis Yahu, the well-known Jewish-American singer, was invited to participate in the Roto Tom Splash or what we, some call the biggest reggae festival in Europe. But a few days before his performance, the BDS movement in Valencia launched a campaign asking the organizers of the festival to kick Matisiao out of the lineup. And, and for those who don't remember the case, can you expand? Because there, there really wasn't much justification for targeting Matisiao, who, uh, you know, he's not even Israeli. Right, yes, but they claimed that even though he's not Israeli, he's an Israeli supporter, and they accused Matisiao of supporting the IDF, which the defendants describe as the, an army that attacks Palestinians and occupies their land. So what happened is that because of the pressure that the campaign put on the organizers, they did decide to cancel Matisiao's show, but only after giving him an ultimatum. Either Matisseau signed a document supporting a Palestinian state and condemning the Israeli government, or he was out. And he, he clearly didn't agree, and that's why his participation was cancelled. Exactly, but this didn't end right there because this decision caused a lot of controversy, and the public called it a discriminatory and anti-Semitic measure. First, because of what you said before, he's not Israeli, and second, Matisseau himself expressed that the activist crossed a very dangerous and thin line when they attacked him for only being Jewish. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually also remember that a part of the issue uh, with respect to the discrimination argument was that only Matis Yahu, who is the only Jewish artist in the lineup that year, uh, was asked to sign the document as exactly, well. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, so after the scandal and thanks to another big campaign against the decision imposed by the BDS, the, organizer, the organizers invite him back and he ended up playing as originally planned. But during the concert, activists waved Palestinian flags and even raised a banner calling him Nazi Yahu. After the show, Matisseau said that he felt threatened, but at the same time, he said that he was proud for performing after all. And he was brave enough to sing, you know, Jerusalem, his hit song, in front That's of right. in the same audience. Uh, but back to today, you know, what about the investigation and the trial? Well, now, after four years, the nine members of the BDS movement in Valencia that participated in this campaign will face the court. The activists are accused of carrying out threatened acts, coercion, and for inciting hatred. And for all these crimes, they could face up to four years in prison. All right, well, I'm sad that it has come to this. Uh, at the same yes. time, it's promising to hear that something is being done about the situation, that it is being taken seriously. Um, and Joy, as always, we'll have you back as soon as there's an update in the story. So thank you, and see you then. Thank you, Aaron. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Nas Daily vlog, you have about a thousand days of catching up to do. The Israeli-Palestinian video blogger named Nusair Yassin, or Nas, set out on a thousand-day challenge around the world, and it all just came to an end. Thankfully, ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with all the details. Thanks, Aaron. Well, like you said, Nas has just completed his goal that he set for himself back in 2016, which was to spend a thousand days traveling the globe and posting daily videos about different cultural and revolutionary topics. Um, Nas himself, like you said again, is an Israeli-Palestinian native of the Lower Galilee, and he marked the end of his journey last week by posting his final 1,000th video on his Facebook page that has nearly 12 million followers. Yeah, no, I, I saw the video, actually, and it was surreal even for me, actually, you know, because I mean, I've seen this guy literally... Every day. Like, almost every day, yeah. yeah. I mean, he's made a video every day for nearly three years. Yeah, and he even sounded surprised by it when he was making the video. But let's take a quick at a really quick clip of his last video. This was hard. This was really hard. Ten minutes ago, I cried. I cried because 
Today is an emotional day. It, it, it marks the end of a thousand day journey from around the world. Every day for a thousand days, I made a video. Never missed a day, not even once. And I don't know how I did it. Because I'm not the hardest worker. I'm not the most committed. I'm not the smartest. Deep down inside, I'm just a kid who was so excited to travel the world and make videos. And to this kid's surprise, you cared. All right, this was, this was really crazy when you I think know. about it. Uh, all the different countries that he's been to and all the obstacles he probably had to face creating so these videos. You know, you, had, you need electricity, Wi-Fi, all the different resources that you may not have in handy, you know, uh, in many of the countries that of he course, went to. Of course, of course. That was definitely part of the struggle that Nas had to face committing to his goal, of course. You know, he's been to almost every corner of the globe, from China to Japan, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Peru. The list goes, you know, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And out of all those places, there's still one video of his that really stuck with me, and that's the one uh, back in October of 2017, where he basically slams the BDS movement, stating that it was pure politics, which is interesting because he doesn't, you know, speak too much mm -hmm. about, um, you know, the conflict in his video, but it made, he made it a point to make a few good mm -hmm. ones to help show both sides. He released a video actually three days before his last day that was titled The Truth About Jews and Arabs, mm -hmm. and the video has already been seen by millions of millions of viewers and has a clear message stating that, quote, the majority of Jews and Arabs actually want to get along. Yeah. Uh, don't let a few bad apples ruin it for everyone, which I think is amazing how he's using his ginormous and unexpected platform in a very smart, very effective way. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. It was, it was a very interesting video that I think everyone at home would benefit from watching. Right. Of course, uh, check out the rest of his very cool videos. Uh, actually, I, we saw you know, a really brief clip of, of the one about you know, humans changing the world. Right. Uh, but anyway, you know, what I'm interested in knowing now is what's the plan for now is going forward? Uh, can we even say the daily part in this daily? I guess it's just <laughs> well, Nas now. Right. Well, as for the daily part, for now, I think it's safe to say just Nas, considering he and his girlfriend, who also helped him out with a lot of his videos yeah. throughout the years, have taken a much-deserved and very mysterious uh, vacation, an actual one. But as of now, he says he will continue to post short videos on his Instagram page as well as his Facebook page, just not as regularly as he did in the past. So I guess... You know, we're just going to have to wait and see what he comes up with next. And he actually didn't disclose the location of his current vacation spot, which I think was really smart. Cool. Yes. Smart. <laughs> All right, Emmanuel, thank you so much for the update. Thank you. True to its reputation, Israel's southern coastal city of Eilat has just been ranked number six in the New York Times' 52 places to go in 2019 list. And the newspaper wrote of Eilat that, quote, beneath the prismatic waters of this Red Sea resort on Israel's southern tip lies a coral reef with hundreds of varieties of neon fish, sharks, and stingrays. But the opening of the new Ramon International Airport is what made the place even more attractive to tourists, providing a direct route to the coastal city with non-stop flights from main European spots including Munich, Frankfurt, Prague, and London. Additionally, the Times added that new hotels including the luxurious Six Senses Shacharut will be opening just in time for the summer when Israel hosts the Eurovision 2019 Song Contest. So all this has earned Eilat the title of a newly accessible Red Sea paradise, and the city was in good company with Puerto Rico being named the top destination to visit, followed by Hampi, India, Santa Barbara, California, Panama, and Munich, Germany taking second through fifth. Israel beat out plenty of other top traditional tourist destinations like Las Vegas though, which came in at number 13 on the list, and New York City which came in at number 31. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, given that Nas Daily has just come to an end with his 1000th and final video, today's word is acharon, meaning last. They say all things must come to an end, but sometimes the last or acharon of something is still more bitter than sweet. Like the last candy in the bag, or hasukaria achona, or how about the last season, or haona achona, of your favorite show. And finally, for my last example, or hadugma achona, the last example, or hadugma achona. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be cool and a bit rainy with a low of 53 or 12 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow you can expect more rain and a slight drop in temperatures to a high of about 60 or 16 degrees Celsius. That's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.67 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.